I made a tweet the other day where I said, the people with the most privilege in America right now are black women with money. These days, I'm telling you, poor whites have a bigger need for affirmative action than poor blacks. There's so many programs out there to help poor blacks. Poor whites have nothing. You want to talk about white privilege? That's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. The stolen elections have consequences. Can you imagine where we might be economically if Trump had been reelected? For all the stuff you don't like Trump for, let me tell you something. And yeah, he spit like a It was horrible. I don't like that aspect. But let me tell you something. You could afford stuff. He was like, well, Joe Biden, he's created more jobs. Yeah, people got to work three of them in order to afford their house. Guys, I don't know if you know what the face of joy on a grown man looks like, but this is it. This is it. Welcome to the cave. I'm having a blast doing the Chad Prather show right here in my little enclave, right here in the little stinky. It sort of smells like a mixture of dog piss and Febreze in here. I'm not going to lie to you. Horshider, he's over there. He's got to smell it. Uh, biscuit, eight pounds of terror. She got up here somehow last week. She got into the cave. And uh, I think she peed somewhere. We have not located where that little puddle of piss is, but by God, it's a big stink. You know what I'm saying? But it's here. So we Febrezed. We've got, well, sometimes we have candles burning. We don't have any today. I'm having a blast. Having a blast. I want you guys to make sure that you're getting the podcast that we're putting out on Tuesdays and Wednesdays that's audio only. You can only get it where podcasts are offered. It's time for some of you older folks that are long in the tooth to learn this technology. I need you to be a part of the 21st century, okay? Listen, listen, listen. Get some earbuds, get some ear pods, whatever you call those things. And while you're doing your laundry and while you're, you're driving down the road, listen to the podcast. Do the thing, okay? And um, I got a burp. I'm a man. There it is. It's out. Okay. Here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to put on your thinking caps with me, all right? And, you know, when you, when you listen to the podcast, you like what I say, you don't like what I say, or you have a question about something I say, we're, we're just up here, man. We're putting our heads together. It sounds like a bowling alley. But I want you to drop me an email if you have a question or if you have a thought. I'd love to hear from you. The email is chad at the chadpraythershow.com. Um... And then you can go leave your email address at thechadpraythershow.com if you want to be on our mailing list, which I'd love to have you. Would love to have you be a part of the Prather Posse, whatever whatever we want to call it. I don't know. But I need your email address so we can stay in touch. And uh, gosh, man, I'm excited. I love being able to do those audio podcasts. I love coming here in the cave and doing this. I want to tell you why big government fails at almost everything, okay? Big government almost fails at everything, and I recommend... Highly recommend you get a hold of my friend Judd Dunning's book, 13 and a Half Reasons Why Not to Be a Liberal. There it is. 13 and a Half Reasons. Let's go over to this camera. Let's go to camera three. Shy, let's see if we can do that right there. It looks good. Oh, yeah. I have devoured this book. I mean, the pages are ripped. They're dog-eared. They're highlighted, all this stuff. He gave me this book when I ran into him at CPAC a number of years ago. And I need to give him a shout and tell him, because I, I want to use the chapters of this book. I want to walk through some things and kind of edu, educate us all, refresh our memories as to why we embrace conservatism. And so, like, if you were to listen to this podcast and you were to read through the chapters of this book, a lot of what I'm going to say here in the next, I don't know, half hour you would probably read along with what Judd said, because I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. I'm just going to toss my thoughts into it as we go through it. But I want him to get all the credit because he deserves it. Uh, I, I just appreciate the way he has helped shape my mind with, with simple information that reminds me. Um, he starts out a chapter with our friend Dennis Prager, who said, the bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. I want you to think about that for a minute. You know, we think that if, if the government gets big and can take care of us in, in cradle-to-grave care, that we're going to be better off. That's, that's simply not true. Now, think about the people you know, the people who are government-dependent. They're reliant on some sort of a welfare system, some sort of, you know, they, they need the government to bail them out. They had a business that suddenly needed a stimulus check, or they're in there getting a small business loan, which is one of the worst kind of loans you can go out there and get. Uh, sometimes they, they really take you for everything you're worth on stuff like that. And you can't tell me any person that's living 
government dependent or check to check or waiting on some kind of stimulus to come in, you can't tell me that person's living a big life. They're not. They're not hanging out on the lake on their boat on the weekends. You know, they're not they're not kicking off vacations. They're not jetting around the world, seeing the sights, visiting the wonders of this globe. They're not doing that. Um, and and not just the things that lavishly you're able to do. I understand poverty exists, and I'm not making light of that. What I am bothered by is the people who have chosen that lifestyle. That's a poverty mentality. And that's a spiritual thing because you've chosen to allow someone else to take care of you. And therefore, you as a citizen have chosen to become complacent. It's easy to be complacent these days. Hey, guys, you know, for 10 years, Patriot Mobile has been America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. And when I say the only one, trust me, they are the only one. And uh, Patriot Mobile has been a great supporter of this show, and I'm proud to continue partnering with them. You know, Patriot Mobile offers uh, dependable nationwide coverage, and they give you access to all three major networks, which means you're going to get the same dependable coverage that you're accustomed to without funding leftist causes. See, when you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending a message. You're saying that you support free speech, religious liberty, uh, the sanctity of life, the Second Amendment, our first responder, and our military heroes. And they have a 100% U.S.-based customer service team, which is going to make switching so easy. You can keep your number, keep your phone. Call them up. They'll help you upgrade with a brand new phone. Whatever you need, their team will help you find the best plan for your needs. You go to patriotmobile.com slash chad. Uh, you call them on the phone if you want to, 972-PATRIOT. Talk to them. And you get free activation when you use promo code CHAD. I spell it Chad. That's right. Join me. Make the switch today. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Chad. That's patriotmobile.com slash Chad. Use promo code Chad. Call them up. 972 Patriot. You know, we got everything literally at our fingertips. Right now, I can go to Amazon and within a matter of hours, stuff will show up at my door. I can get on... Uh, the DoorDash, Uber Eats, food that's already prepared will show up here. I can get on, uh, I can get on my bank account. In fact, it just showed me a notification. I, I just spent fourteen dollars and fifty cents on something. My bank just told me it sent me a notification. I have no idea what I spent fourteen fifty on. I don't, I don't know what it was, but it notified me. Uh, I can. Yesterday, I went to the airport. Went to the airport. I clicked on an app, and a stranger pulled up in a big black suburban and pick me up. I didn't even have to pick my bag up. He put it in the back for me. I climbed in the back, drove down the street. He dropped me off at the airport. Amazing. I can get on Facebook. I can make friends with people that I've never met in my life. I've never met you face to face. I can have uh, interaction with people I haven't seen in 30 years. Maybe I graduated high school with them. It's easy for us to get complacent. Everything is at your finger fingertips. And here's the thing. All of that has been created by private sectors. They create the new technologies and we just lap it up. They improve our lives. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but you know, private sector is getting bigger and bigger and the public sector has just spiraled downward. It's regressed. But why is it that we continue to want to hold on to the public sector things and praise them as though they're taking care of us? So you got big government expansion. That's a dangerous problem to have because it is going to be a threat to your American individual liberty. And the health of our nation's future is in danger. It's in peril. It's in jeopardy because we're relying on the government. The government is going to destroy wealth faster than anything. It's the biggest consumer. It's going to consume it faster than the private sector can actually create it. That's a dangerous place to be. It's not sustainable. That's why we're in the situation where we're in. You talk about Bidenomics, you don't want to talk about an all-consuming fire of big government that's just going to eat everything up. And then you have this large segment of our society. And Oh, oh and by the way, this is not just liberals. This is conservatives, too. I can't tell you how many so-called in nomenclature, people who call themselves conservatives who live this same way, that have been conditioned to, to see this government help, this government handout as a positive thing. Government-assisted living, uh, more and more welfare, the idea that Social Security is great. Nothing, absolutely nothing could be further from the truth than those, than those things. 
but yet people continue to defend them. Now, the more that people are going to come to rely on the state to take care of them, that nanny state, cradle to grave, the more they're going to develop a sense of entitlement. They're going to think the world owes them something. Well, the government's conditioned them to think that way. How many times do you see people out there? I made a tweet the other day. Oh, I love stirring the pot. I made a tweet the other day where I said, the people with the most privilege in America right now are black women with money. <laughs> it's true. How, how, many how many times? Well, people say, well, no, it's just black women in general. Somebody commented back. I said, no, no, they're just arrogant. They're just arrogant. You don't believe me? Uh, pull up to the Walmart. And, and stop at the lane crossing where people walk across and, you know, you're being nice. You let people go on across it's a pedestrian crossing. You're doing the right thing. And watch how slow people will walk in front of you. They're not in a hurry to get across there. I mean, I want to just step on the gas and peel the peel the shoe off the heel of their foot and just be like, move your fat ass out of my way. Like, go. I'm being polite to you. Be considerate and get out of the damn street. But these people have a sense of entitlement. I said, no, a lot of these people are just airing it. It's the people with money, a little bit of money, a little bit of wealth. They're the ones with the privilege. And you can't call them out as women because that's misogynist. Can't call them out as black because that's racist. See, you've been conditioned to believe that. I call people out for what they are. I don't care what the melanin content of your, uh, you know, epidermis is. I, I really don't care. But see, the government has taught us to feel entitled. And so what we do, we end up with two different negative character traits ingratitude and resentment the more people expect for them to they, they expect to be given things the less grateful they're going to be for what they receive and then when you take those entitlements away guess what they're going to become they're going to become resentful huh. so this is the nation we're living in right now people that have no gratitude and they're resentful why why do you think pe if these these climate protesters these pro-Palestine protesters, all these people, they can go out there. That's entitlement. You've, that's, that's ingratitude to a nation which has provided you freedoms. And now you're going to be sympathetic towards S Saddam Hussein's, not Saddam Hussein, I'm sorry, Osama bin Laden and his letter to America. You're going to be sympathetic. You're going to get on TikTok and say, well, he made a point. Yeah, he made a point. It was a bad one. No gratitude whatsoever. And then they resent the government because they're not getting everything they think they're owed. You see, when people go into government, I ran for office right over here. There's an old campaign poster that we made a painting out of. I don't think we can get in the shot over there. It's, it's kind of out of the deal. But you've seen it. Uh, people that go into the government, they run for office, they do it with good intentions. They really do want to serve the public. But, you know, Milton Friedman, my favorite economist, everybody's, you know, on the conservative side, his, the, our favorite economist, Milton Friedman said one of the greatest mistakes or one of the great mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results. See, there's a lot of policies out there that started out with good intentions. And we say, but see, what they were trying to do was, yeah, but did they do it? They didn't do it. Judge it by the results. Not what the intention was when you walked into it, because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. See, intentions, those are emotional. And we're all about feelings and not facts these days. So it's all about the emotion right now. But, but results, those are factual. Those are rational. Those are measurable. What are the results? So I want you to change your mindset if, if you're... If you, See, that's the essence of the, of the progressive mindset right now is how do I feel about this policy? How do I feel about the southern border? How, how, do, how do I feel about razor wire? How do I feel about migrants? How do I feel about Russia's invasion of Ukraine? How do I feel, 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 stop feeling? What are the results? What is the end game going to be? So the problem is, and the facts bear up, under this is that most government programs, too many of them, end up resulting in unintended consequences that are going to deliver crushing blows to the people that they claim they're trying to help. Now, I want to say that to you again. The consequences crush the people they were supposed to help. So, you know, small government, 
which is something that I believe in, limited government. We're never going to have small government again. It's gotten too big. It's a Leviathan. It's a dragon. It's way too big. We fed the thing. It's Game of Thrones, which I didn't even watch, but apparently the little baby dragon got huge. <laughs> Started smoking everybody. I mean, you know, every time that bitch got pissed off at a village, boom, she just burned them up with her dragon. Is that, Shatter, is that kind of the way it went? Is that a synopsis? I never watched it. I never could get past the winter is coming and that was all. And somebody was sleeping with somebody and pushed them out of a window. And I don't know. I just know there was a dragon. It was a baby dragon. It was a big dragon. And that's what government's become. You're not getting the dragon back in the cave. Okay. So limited government, like actually that's attainable. We can limit their reach. So our founding fathers, when they started the United States of America, they actually had a small government vision. I mean, that's why they fought the Revolutionary War. That was, the Revolutionary War was actually a push back against the world's major superpower of the day, King George III, his monarchy, and the British Empire. They pushed back because that was big government. And small government, since the time of the Revolutionary War, the institution of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, small government's given more, more people, more freedom, and more opportunity to live a better life than any other country has ever in the history of humanity. We're living in, we're, I mean, the fact that you had the, the, the blessed privilege of being born by God's providence or to come to this country and live in this country and embrace this country and assimilate to the freedoms that have been promised to you by those founding fathers. What a blessing that is. I mean, in all of human history, you were put in the most perfect place with the most perfect opportunity. Well, it looks like a storm is coming in. And you know, the funny thing about storms is they don't care if you're ready for them or not. I want you to be ready when the storm hits. Sometimes when it hits, it's too late. You can't prepare then. You know, there's warning signs, the thunder, the clouds, the lightning in the sky. They let you know that it's time to expect a storm. You also know that the time to prepare for the storm is always right now. Now, I wanna help you prepare for the coming storm. I want you to go to my special website, preparewithchad.com. When you're there, you're going to automatically save $200 on an essential three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Over the years, My Patriot Supply has helped millions of American families prepare for emergencies. Your family should be next. Now, sealed inside the ultra-durable packaging is their delicious meals that are going to last up to 25 years in storage and provide over 2,000 calories a day. You're able to eat right whenever things go wrong. And uh, these three-month emergency food kits from My Patriot Supply are going to help you do that. You need one for every member of your family. $200 in savings. You can get enough for each member. They all deserve protection, right? Go to preparewithchad.com. Order by 3 p.m. any given day, and you will get free shipping on the same day. The website, preparewithchad.com. Prepare for the storm. Government, I don't want you to get me wrong, because government is needed. I I'm not pushing for anarchy. I'm not saying, I mean, sometimes that's a temptation to just say, screw it, we'll just govern ourselves. Uh, we got to have government, but it's got to be in limited form. I mean, you read your Bible, you can hear the word, listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus advocated for governor, the apostle government, the, the apostle Paul advocated for government. But, the, you know, there, there's a balance there. Now, you know, the liberals are going to come to you and they're going to say, you know, we got to have government intervention. We got to have economic intervention. That's what's best for our country because it levels the playing field. What are we talking about these days? DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. But see, here's the facts on that. Government programs, most of them at least, I won't say all, but most of them fail. I mean, how many times has government uh, interventionist ideas destroyed lives and spread misery? We just lived through the pandemic. Did you not see what happened between 20 and 22? How many businesses were, I mean, I'm still seeing businesses close their doors because they can't recover from what happened economically and the government that shut them down. They can't recover. Here's a big example. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You know, they had come through the Great Depression, 1929 into the 30s. And FDR is the president, and he comes up with the New Deal. People praise FDR and the New Deal. It's going to lift America out of the Great Depression. Uh, that's a myth. That's a myth. It didn't happen. The Supreme Court actually struck down a huge chunk of the New Deal because it wasn't constitutional. 
And so what he did, uh, does this sound familiar? What FDR did was he tried to retaliate by packing the courts to try to push it through. You know the best thing that happened for FDR? You know what helped him? You know what actually boosted America out of the Great Depression? You know what saved the economy? Give you a guess. I'll tell you. It was World War II. World War II was the best thing that happened to FDR's economy. That's the best thing. It ended the Depression. It created the jobs that FDR failed to create in his first nine years as president. Hey, he had three terms. Eight years, he couldn't get it done. The ninth year, he couldn't get it done. World War, III, World War II happened. World War II happened. Then you had LBJ. You know, Lyndon Johnson comes along. He declares war on poverty. Guess who won the war? Poverty. You know who suffered the most in those social programs of the 1960s? You know how many of the lives were destroyed? You know who that targeted and who it hurt more than anybody? You know, I heard you say it. Minority lives, specifically blacks. When you have 67 to 74 percent, it depends on what year we're counting. I think right now, if you go back to 22, when you have real numbers that we can measure, I think we're looking at about 67 percent. But Let's say 70% of the illegitimacy rates among blacks, it's decimated the black nation, the black neighborhoods, the black community. It has. Newt Gingrich and the Republican Congress, whenever Newt was the Speaker of the House, they, uh, they dragged Bill Clinton kicking and screaming into a strong welfare reform law. Welfare rolls plummeted. When Barack Obama was president, he gutted the work requirements. You know what happened? Welfare rolls and the people on food stamps, record numbers. Those type policies don't work. FDR tried them, didn't work. LBJ tried them, doesn't work. Bill Clinton tried them, doesn't work. Barack Obama. Then, then this guy, this guy, quite honestly, comes along. His name's Donald Trump. And he reinstitutes the work requirements, and guess what happens? Welfare rolls dropped. They went down. You remember back in 2008, Barack Obama, the housing crisis? You know why that housing crisis, that balloon popped? Why it happened? Well, it was because of prior government policies. You had, you had Barney Frank, who was, the, who was the congressman from Massachusetts. You had Senator Chris Dodd from Connecticut. They're going to play racial politics with the banks. Big government's getting involved. Why? Because it sounds good. It sounds, sounds kind. It sounds nice. Like, this is the sweet thing we need to do for these folks. And uh, they go to these banks that are under threat of closure. And they bully them into giving mortgage, mortgages that they never should have given to poor minorities who could not afford them. Everybody deserves a house, right? I mean, doesn't that sound altruistic? Doesn't that sound like exactly what we need to do so everybody can realize the American dream? Well, guess what? Most of those borrower, borrowers, they stopped making payments on their house, led to foreclosure, and that's when the market crashed. The nation got hurt by unnecessary government meddling. And you know who was hurt the most? The black community. Minorities. Because now, they really were homeless. They spent everything. They had nothing. You know, you had Barack Obama who comes in and for eight years, two terms, tries to create jobs. He didn't do it. He had that stimulus. Remember that whole thing? You didn't build that. Remember that whole rhetoric, that whole deal? Talking about shovel-ready jobs. And then he goes out there and speaks to that business panel and he says, well, I guess shovel-ready wasn't as shovel-ready as we expected. That's a quote. Because it, it, it wasn't available. It wasn't there. You know, Obama says, well, you know, everybody deserves health care. Let's get the government involved so everybody can get some health care. Let's bring along the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare. And uh, I don't have to tell you, that's a spectacular failure. And let me tell you why it's a failure. Because it was an ideological redistribution scheme. That's all it was. It was going to take from those who have and give to those who don't. But see, that doesn't work. That Robin Hood philosophy of big government getting involved, it's just bureaucratic bullshit. It never works. So what happens is it's insurance, health insurance. So the premiums going to get raised on the people who have some money. Typically, a lot of them who are going to vote Republican, their premiums go through the roof so that Obama's base, those, you know, those poor Democrats out there, they're going to get free health care. So policy and politics 
leads to disaster. So what happens? Millions of people started seeing their policies canceled. Their premiums went through the roof. You know, those hurt by the law dwarfed the comparably few people who benefited. You remember Barack Obama so proud and arrogantly puffing out his chest and saying, if you like your doctor, if you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. Remember that? PolitiFact named that lie of the year in 2013. You didn't get to keep your doctor. And, and it wasn't affordable. <laughs> and they forced you to do it. And if you didn't do it and you didn't have health care, you were penalized. You were penalized. You had to pay a fine if you didn't have health care, if you didn't have health insurance. I mean, remember when Obama tried to create the whole uh, green energy revolution? He made you go out and buy light bulbs. I mean, we've been using the same kind of light bulbs, same kind of filaments for 100 years. They worked. Well, here's the problem. Barack doesn't have a whole lot of light bulbs going off in his head. So he comes up with this idea, says, well, we got to get these newfangled light bulbs out here, replace the standard light bulbs because those aren't good enough anymore. We got to do this whole deal. And uh, then we got to get everybody in America to start using solar panels. And then people rejected that. He wasted billions of dollars on taxpayer money on Solyndra, a whole bunch of other failures. No budget constraints. Piles up more debt than the first 43 presidents combined out of this desperate zeal for fundamentally transforming a nation. Which, guess what, Barack? The nation got a lot right before you were ever even born, buddy. But no, step in there, and in the name of ideological agendas, you screwed a lot of shit up. That's where we're living now. The government doesn't pick winners and losers. They're, they shouldn't be allowed to. They shouldn't be able to meddle like that. That's the essence of, of big government. You shouldn't be able to pick. I'll give you this, and this is straight out of the book, 13 and a half reasons why not to be a liberal. I'm going to give this to you, right to it. This, this is exactly the way Judd wrote it. He said, government shouldn't be in the business of picking winners and losers. President George W. Bush, he got plenty... He got some things right, but even he was pushed into playing favorites on Wall Street. Some of you will remember this. Bush refused to bail out failing companies. Democrats tried to tie him to Enron, which was weird because Enron was a green energy climate alarmism company. But when Enron begged for a bailout, he told him no. And six months before the financial crisis, he refused to bail out Bear Stearns. But the reckoning came on Wall Street. September 2008, Lehman Brothers burned and Bush left them. Goldman Sachs was teetering. Bush was persuaded under extreme pressure to abandon his free market principles. Goldman was deemed too big to fail. Could it be that Goldman had powerful government friends and Lehman did not? Former Goldman CEO Robert Rubin, he was Clinton's Treasury Secretary. And then Goldman CEO Hank Paulson held the same position under George W., Paulson and the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke made a compelling argument, credited seized up without government liquidity in the form of bailouts. The global financial system could break down the government. Powerful, but still begs an important question. Why save Goldman, but not Lehman? Where's the ethics in that? There's a word for that. There's a phrase for it. It's crony capitalism. So what happened is that opened the floodgates for Obama to follow Bush and then spend into the stratosphere and the whole mantra of never let a serious crisis go to waste. See, that's the beauty of America, folks. The beauty of America. Nobody wants to hear this. What I'm about to tell you, nobody wants to hear what I'm about to say. The beauty of America is you have the freedom to fail. That's the glorious thing about this country. Businesses have the freedom to fail. Nobody has to bail you out. Life's not fair. Life's not equal. <laughs> My God, people aren't equal. I, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? There's, there's no equality of opportunity. Say, so, oh, you got privilege. Maybe I do, and then maybe you do. I don't know, but see, life ain't, life ain't fair. Life ain't equal. We got a bunch of kids walking around. I hear kids all the time right now going, that's not fair. No shit. Good. It shouldn't be. I, I had a beautiful little, you know, playing baseball. I had, I had a beautiful time playing baseball when I was a young man, but... Uh, Life ain't equal and life ain't fair. There were some guys out there with a better arm than me. They were faster than me. They could hit further than me. They could bench press more than me. They could do a lot. I, I wasn't a bad ball player, but I had to work for what I had because I wasn't one of those naturals. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't Roy Hobbs out there in the movie, you know. I, I wasn't that natural guy because life ain't fair and life ain't equal. And I'm okay with that. And sometimes when you have a threat of getting cut from the team, it pushes you to work a lot harder. So you got 
you got, you know, every generation, you have these entrepreneurs that are going to come along and they create the next big thing that everybody's got to have. Here's an iPhone. Then iPhone's going to change around. We were just talking about it, Shider. They got to have a different kind of dongle and a different kind of charger and all this kind of stuff. And somebody's going to come along. And we complain about that. Oh, my God, there's a new update that's got to come. I got to get all of this stuff. Well, <laughs> you know, turning rags to riches is a lot more common than a lot of us uh, want to believe. Look at Mike Lindell, my buddy. Mike Lindell. He creates my pillow. If you haven't read Mike Lindell's book, you should go do it. I, I don't care what you think of the guy. You can't deny his entrepreneurial success. You can't. I mean, he, Mike Lindell was a drug addict. Mike, it, Mike Lindell was such a crack addict that his two drug dealers held an intervention for him. They literally said, we're cutting you off, dude. You'll be dead. His two drug dealers stopped him. And so what happens? He lost his marriage, lost his savings. He gambled everything away. He was a gambling addict. He's a multimillionaire today, a wealthy man. Why? Because he built my pillow. He built a better mousetrap. I mean, something as simple as a pillow? Yeah, who needs to redo pillows? Mike did it. And guess what? He won. He succeeded. People love their pillows. People love their slippers. People love their dog mattresses. I love their dog mattresses, for crying out loud. I love the, all of my towels down there. You take a towel out to my swimming pool when you come over to my house, it's going to be a my pillow towel. They're great. And they're cheap. And I think you can still use Prather as a promo code and get 66% off at MyPillow.com. How's that? Entrepreneurial spirit, baby. Use promo code Prather. Mike did it. That's the beauty. You can fail and pull yourself rags to riches. You can go rags to riches, back to rags, back to riches. That's your choice. See, this is America. Yeah, we, we don't want you going into debtor's prison. And we actually have bankruptcy laws, which will keep you from that. Uh, you don't have to go to jail over that. But that's the thing. You have the freedom to be an entrepreneur or a small business owner, whatever. You can, you can fail in business and you can start again. Problem is government gets involved and tries to stop all that from happening. They're trying to stop your failure. And that sounds good. But let me go back to what I said. The intentions, you know, road to hell kind of thing. It sounds really good. But the end result is bad. Creative destruction. Actually, it works. You want to prevent that, and, and guess what? It's going to lead to stagnation. Remember what I said a little while ago, World War II, something as horrible as World War II actually bailed us out, brought us up. It didn't bail us out. It lifted us up out of the Great Depression. You look at Japan, you look at Europe, you look at what's going on in France right now. We all hold France up like, oh, France, it's wonderful. The stinky cheese and wines and stuff like that. We just had Baptiste Marche on here telling you how crappy it is in France right now. That's why I keep using France, because so many of the elites out there want to point to France like it's some kind of utopia. It's not. We don't want to head that direction. For some reason, I don't know, Justin Trudeau in Canada with his French-speaking wee-wee bonjour crap thinks that if Canada can be more like France, that's what you're running it like a dictatorship. I want to tell you, though, about our, uh, our sponsor, United Patriot Coin. You know... If you follow me on social media at all, United Patriot Coins has been a good friend of mine for a long, long time. Uh, they are who I trust for gold and silver. A lot of a lot of times, people in their hard economic times are trying to figure out, you know, this, you know, economic uncertainty that we're living in with all these weird things that are going on in our world. What do you do? Well, I always advise people: you need to have some gold and silver. And I know there are people out there who say we well, can't eat gold and silver. Trust me, you need some gold and silver on hand. You need some bullion. You need some coins. You need some stuff you can barter with. There's various things you can use to do that with, but some gold and silver would be a good thing to have on hand. So the folks that I trust, unitedpatriotcoin.com, head over there. You can call them on the phone as well. Talk to Trey on the phone. Tell them Chad sent you, and uh, he'll walk you through all kind of investment opportunities that are out there. So check them out. See, when your business fails, you don't want government. I don't want the government to come bail me out. Here's the thing. If I fail or a business fails, I do it with my own money. Now, again, unless you're one of those crony capitalists where the government's going to come bail you out with subsidies and all this other crap, but that's going to be to the detriment and punishment of other people who's got to pay for that. When the government programs fail, well, they're wasting money. See, with a private business, you fail, that's your money. You know, in business, if that, if that idea keeps failing, they fire the CEO. That's what happened. There's a consequence to all of that. You know what happens when the government keeps failing? Those people keep getting reelected. 
That's, that's what the hell is going on, folks? That doesn't work. You're a CEO that fails. You got to go when there's no reward or, 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 you know, for success or there's no punishment for failure. There's going to be indifference, which is going to lead to more failure. So you see, our government keeps doing these really bad ideas, these really bad policies in the name of taking care of our feelings and feeling good about things. And then they fail. And then what happens is we don't punish them for that. They stay in office for 50 years, Joe Biden. And they say, ah, yeah, nothing's going to happen. So there's indifference and they're they're happy to float more bad freaking ideas out there. I don't I don't have enough time to discuss all of the different ideas that are out there. But let me just let me give you an exercise. Let me give you an exercise. Ask every liberal, you know. Everybody get online, jump on there. They're out there. Poof, well, they're happy to talk to you. They, they're disingenuous in their conversation, their debate and their arguments. But whatever you ask them to name one significant big government program that's ever worked i dare you i dare you they'll say social security they'll say medicare but that's not true i see it all the time when i get online and i talk about the dangers of socialism or you don't have a problem with social security or medicare or the public roads or the postal system Mm, yeah actually i do because they don't work they don't work see you take your slogans and shove them because that again doesn't work. I don't care about your slogans. I don't care about your intentions. I care about the results. Those programs, Social Security and Medicare, they're always flirting with insolvency. They eat up the largest portion of our federal budget. They consume. They're that big Game of Thrones dragon, just breathing fire, eating up everything. Social Security, I've said this for 30 years. It's not social and it's not secure. In another 30 years, it won't exist. I have no intention of retiring. And if I do, there's nothing there for, there's nothing there for me in Social Security. It's not going to be there. I can't live off of that. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the government f that up for you. Thank you, America. Thank you. And we let them do it. You know, listen, I, I gosh, how deep in the weeds do we want to go with this? You've heard me talk about the two, you know, over the years, you've heard me talk about the two different schools of economic thought. You know, there's the demand side and there's the supply side. See, the demand side or Keynesian economics, that's, that's, you know, that's a very liberal way of thinking about things. Uh, you know, the Keynesians actually support active government intervention. They want the government involved. Tax hikes. They think that's going to stimulate economic growth. That's the Bidenomics, okay? That's, that's Obamanomics, those kind of things. Now, the supply siders, those are the people who support the tax cuts to stimulate the economic growth. And, and the results are crystal clear, folks. There's a good book out there called The New Conservative Paradigm uh, by an economist. He's a supply side guy, uh, Tom Del Beccaro. And he talks about the the tax policy. He kind of recaps it. uh, And he talks about presidents who have embraced one side or the other. So you take JFK, John Kennedy, 1961. He was a a supply side guy. Uh, Yes, he was Democrat, but he was a supply side guy. He uh, he believed that would stimulate economic growth. And guess what? It did. Richard Nixon comes along, who's a Republican. He was opposed to it. He, he said, that's a gimmick. You see what happened. Ronald Reagan in 1981, he comes back. He's a supply side guy, brings the tax cuts and uh, boom, takes off. George W. Bush, supply side tax cuts, 2001, 2002, 2003. It worked. Uh, Trump was a supply side guy, still is. He understands these economics. You might not like Trump. You might not like his spray tan. You might not like his comb over. You might not like the way he tweets. But tweets equal world peace, baby. Those mean tweets equal world peace. We're starting to see that. But he comes in and uh, what happens? I mean, his 2017 tax cuts You say, we just reward the rich. Let me tell you what it did. It ended a decade of stagnation under Obama. Uh, I mean, Obama for 31 quarters, 31 quarters. He was a Keynesian economics guy. He's a, he's a, you know, he's the other side of things. 31 quarters from 2009 to 2017. He only saw a 2.2% growth all of that time. Eight years. He saw a 2.2% growth. Trump, between 2017 and 2019, saw 3%. That quick. That quick. 
And you normally you don't see the results from that until a second term. That's what history has proven over and over again. Well, you see, that's why I keep telling you guys, stolen elections have consequences. Can you imagine where we might be economically if Trump had been reelected? For all the stuff you don't like Trump for, let me tell you something. And yeah, he spit like a, it was horrible. I don't like that aspect. But let me tell you something. You could afford stuff. He was like, well, Joe Biden, he's created more jobs. Yeah, people got to work three of them in order to afford their house. I don't want to have to work three jobs. I don't want my wife to go out and work two jobs. I don't want everybody in the house having to pull their way. I would like to be able to afford things, keep a roof over my head. I don't want to live in a world where I got to pay 31% of my annual income just to afford my mortgage. I should be able to put a tank of gas in the car. I should be able to go to the grocery store and without going, it cost what? This is insane, folks, the world we're living in right now. Imagine where we would be. If Trump had, 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 you know, if Joe Biden had not been installed, stolen elections have consequences. I don't have to get into the fact that Iran's drone striking us, hundreds of attacks on American interests and American troops, American vessels, American supply lines just in the last six months, hundreds on the part of Iran. Stolen elections have consequences, folks. You say, I don't like that kind of terminology. I don't like you lying to me and telling me that Joe Biden, who couldn't, fun, who can't find his balls with his with, with either hand, it, this guy doesn't know where he's at, licking his windows in the basement, talking to dead people, wandering off like, you know, I mean, he looks like somebody that should be doing a commercial for com- Colonial Pin Life Insurance for crying out loud. And you're going to tell me that guy got 81 million votes? Kiss my fat white ass. No way. You're going to tell me that Joe Biden got more black votes than anyone in the history of the United States of America, including Barack Obama, who got elected twice? Oh, my God. Here we are. Here we are. And you say, yeah, but but everything, everything messed up. Remember, the, the American economy cratered under Trump in 2020. Hey, yeah, that's because we had this global pandemic. I mean, this historical thing. COVID-19 hit, the coronavirus got out of the lab in Wuhan, and all these medical experts come along. And again, I'm going to say experts in quotations for those of you who are listening and not watching. They convinced Trump to just shut down a whole bunch of the entire American economy to slow the spread of this whole, the whole COVID, you know, nightmare. And that's what happened. Trump did that wrong. But again, he stopped being a businessman and he started being a politician. And damn it, it screwed things up, didn't it? Because government getting involved always screws things up. Trump did great as long as Trump was a businessman. Trump the politician? Mm-mm. No, 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 no. That's shoveling more manure than those French farmers can dump on the gates of the Louvre. I, I know I'm not interested in that, dude. I don't want Trump the politician. Bring me Trump the businessman. So, yeah. You know, they shut the economy down because of COVID. We had this huge economic contraction in 2020. Economic closure. But that has nothing to do with the Trump tax cuts and there, you can't draw a correlation between that. There's no equality between that and the, and the COVID-19 crash. So there you go. Ah, uh, boy, there's so many different things I could go in on that deal. I mean, and just if you want to do a little history lesson, let, let me just sum, what up, sum up what I just said. You had four presidents that tried, just in recent history, in the last half century, you've had four presidents that tried the supply side approach. One was a Democrat. That was JFK. Then you had three Republicans. All right. You had three Republicans, Ronald Reagan, W, and Trump, and it worked. Just telling you, we had economic growth in every single one of those. The demand side, the Keynesian economics, uh, you had FDR. Let me just name off a couple of these folks. You had, uh, you had, you had uh, Franklin Roosevelt. You had Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Jimmy Carter, baby. Uh, you had George H.W. Bush, and then you had Bill Clinton. And uh, it actually worked under Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton got lucky. The reason Bill Clinton got lucky is because he inherited a very strong economy that was growing at nearly 5% in the fourth quarter of 1992. And so uh, his tax hikes actually slowed growth, but he was bailed out by something called the Internet Revolution. So it's sort of an anomaly, right? So whereas the COVID pandemic hurt Trump, the dot-com boom, the internet revolution actually helped Bill Clinton. So again, there are anomalies to this, but you see what happens. Um, 
when you got an unparalleled wealth creation, you know, that people have never seen before, it actually makes up for the tax hikes. So uh, Obama was the fifth president who tried that, you know, the Keynesian demand side economics. And guess what? He failed. He, he nearly tipped America back into a recession. And Obama really made it easy for Trump, who all he had to do is just do the opposite of what Obama did. See, that's why that's why, guys, I'm pushing you. I'm telling you in this stage in the game, I, I don't care what you think of the man on a personal level. You got to put Trump back in there. Uh, yeah, he's got he's got his flaws and he's got things that he did wrong. But but look at Bidenomics and how bad Bidenomics are. Look how bad they are. It's going to be so easy if Trump is reelected just to come back in. If he can keep his head about him and not play political games and not go after the full blown retribution stuff. But just come in there and be the businessman that we uh, we hired him to be back in 2016. If he'll do that, if he'll do that, just do the opposite. Think of the economic growth and boom that we can see by just getting these big government, uh, you know, Keynesian economics, these uh, these demand side economics out of the way. It, it, it's it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. Ah, so many things I could get into. Let me just tell you, they've all failed. Big government always fails. The EPA, you know, they're, they're, believe it or not, they were protecting the environment before the EPA came along. I'll let you do a little research on that. They were actually effectively protecting the environment, making changes, passing legislation, because you want to protect the environment, you do it on the legislative side. Don't do it on the activism side. It's sort of throwing soup on the Mona Lisa at the Louvre like they did last week. That, and nobody's stopping to listen to your stupid ass. Nobody. You want to sit in the street, glue your hand to the asphalt. Nobody's stopping to listen to you. You're crazy. You see, mental illness is a bigger issue than climate alarmism. I promise you. Nobody's going to stop and listen to you when you're destroying works of art and, you know, losing your hand because it got cemented to, to the tarmac somewhere. Legislatively, we were actually doing something about the environment. I, and listen, trust me, I believe we should take care of our world. That's a biblical principle. It says that creation groans longing for the revelation of the sons of God. You can read that in the New Testament. I believe there's something living about the way that God created the earth. He talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Both of them are going to be renewed. I think that, they're, that, they're, that we are to be good stewards of the earth and treat it right. But yeah, not the what they're talking about because they've created a God out of the earth which is a complete other type of idolization. You take Social Security, failed, higher taxes, never work, affirmative action. I will say this about affirmative action. If they would run affirmative action the way it's supposed to, it will actually, it's actually good for society. But see, here's the thing. We made affirmative action about skin color. Mm -mm, that's the wrong thing. You see, it's not, it, it shouldn't just, it should be based on income. There's, there's poor white people, too. I was going to say there's poor yellow people, but not many. <laughs> not many because of their work ethic, because they understand that with failure comes some dishonor. It comes it, it comes with a lot of baggage. I mean, there's some things that they say, you know what? That's not acceptable in our household. We're not going to do that. We're going to work harder. We're going to be better. So, so the people with the so-called yellow skin. They actually are the highest paid demographic in the United States of America for so many reasons. Their work ethic, their practice, the way they do things, their application to excellence. Scheider's over there nodding his head. He knows what's up. He grew up there. He grew up in that world. He's got the same freaking mindset. Why do you think Scheider's here? Because he pursues excellence, and I love that. God forbid, man. Huh, these are the kind of things people don't want to hear. But see, affirmative action should be, it should be based on income, not race. You know, uh, everybody, if you're a reasonable person, you should agree that, uh, God, do I even want to say this statement? These days, I'm telling you, poor whites have a bigger need for affirmative action than poor blacks. They do. There's so many programs out there to help poor blacks. Poor whites have nothing. You want to talk about white privilege? That's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. It's not. You are actually increasing poverty. You are. You use it right, it could be something, but it's not going to be. And eh, that'll come back to bite me in the ass. That's a sound bite they won't like. It's a soundbite they won't like, but statistics prove it. But again, you're about feelings, right? You're about feelings and not the facts. Eh, I'm just giving you some stuff that's quantitative, qualitative things you can measure. Universal health care didn't work. Tax the rich didn't work. Let me tell you something. I'm going to read something out of Joe, Judd's book here. He says right here, he said, here's the liberal argument. He says, we must raise taxes and make the rich pay their fair share to best take care of the middle class and poor. 
well, you know, that doesn't work. And I can already hear some of you guys shout your argument at the, at the speaker right now. He says, the power to tax is the power to destroy. That's right. Of all the ways government can damage an economy, raising taxes is the easiest and most destructive. Liberals would happily raise taxes on everyone because their vision of government requires it. However, massive tax increases on everybody is not politically feasible. Liberals insist that they're only raising taxes on the rich. They never specify what qualifies a person or family as rich. Most people do not see themselves as rich. They're fine sticking it to the wealthy until they figure out that the government is talking about them. Oh, they are too. They want to take, if they could get away with it, they would tax you 100%. You would literally work for the state. Some of you are still caught up on what I said about affirmative action between blacks and whites. I want to recommend another book to you. It's a book called The Iron Triangle. <laughs> you need to read this. This is a book, uh, Vince Everett Ellison. This will blow your mind. Oh, and by the way, let me show it. Let me show them. We practiced this here. Let me get the glare out of it. That's a black man. Vince is black. Vince wrote the book Iron Triangle. Highly recommend you jump on Amazon right now. And, and, and I'd love to meet this man because this guy right here, he'll, he'll call you cow out of the pasture right there. I mean, I'm telling you, this book right here, it'll blow your mind. How Democrats are using race to divide Americans in their quest for power and how we can stop them. I say those things. I'm a racist, Shider. Oh, just give me that free health care. Well, I don't need the free health care. Other countries have free health care. It doesn't work, guys. It's inferior to the quality of America's health care. Europe sucks. Canada sucks. Old people in some of those countries, they don't rank much higher than dogs because the government has declared them too old to have expensive life-saving procedures. Um, man, oh, man, oh, man. Uh, I, you know, let me just sum it up with this. We got to go. What is the government supposed to do? Why does the government exist? Well, the government is real simple. If they get it, anytime you, you just mark my word, anytime the government gets off of this script, we're destined to failure. Always. What should government do? Government should provide for the national defense. All right. And they should do that with a strong military, but it should always be under the control of a civilian president. Now, you can get out of that, you started getting into fascism, legitimate fascism, you get into dictatorship, all right? That's, that's not what we're advocating for. That's why the founding fathers knew that, it, that the commander-in-chief should always be a civilian president. They should ensure that our social security checks and other similar administrative functions are handled. They should do that. But again, they're handling our money. I paid you. I entrusted you with my hard-earned income so that I would have something that comes back to me one day. That's your job to handle that. They're not doing it. Everything else in our country can be and should be privatized. That includes the post office. That includes the Department of Motor Vehicles, building the roads. I, my friend Eric July, how many times have we sat on my program on another set and talked about you know, you want to talk about, uh, well, what, who's going to fix the roads? I promise you, you get out there and bounce around enough, somebody will freaking get out there and fix those roads. There will be somebody who comes along and says, hey, I got a solution. You pay me. I'll come fix your roads. And they'll be billionaires. There'll be an Elon Musk. There'll be a Jeff Bezos. There'll be a Bill Gates. I don't care what you think about those people personally, but there will be masters of enterprise who come along and say, you know what? The government ain't going to fix this or do it well, so we just step out there and do it. But right now, while the government's handling it, there is no incentive for anybody to get out there and do it. The Constitution is a charter of negative liberties. Unless the federal government is specifically empowered to do something, it's prohibited from doing it. Think about that. Unless we specifically empower them to do it, then they shouldn't be doing it. That's where I live. That's, that's, my, that's my philosophy of life. That's my philosophy of politics. That's my philosophy of culture. Don't, de don't be doing jobs you're not supposed to be doing. Government needs to be returned to its constitutional role. The executive branch, you look at, you look at what Joe Biden's doing. This expansive power of the executive branch is 100% exactly why George Washington did not want to be president of the United States, because he didn't want to be another King George. And, and what was it that Barack Obama always talked about? I got a phone and a pen. I got a phone and a pen. I can do whatever I want to do. Joe Biden said, I don't work for you. 
Well, let me tell you something, you senile son of a bitch. Who do you think you work for? You work for the puppet masters, right? The people who are writing out the teleprompter, the people who are giving you the cue cards, the people who are controlling the news media and who you're supposed to call on to ans ask you the next question because you've got the answer already somehow written in crayon in your mind. Government's got to be returned back to the constitutional role. Founding fathers, they deliberately and severely restricted the government from getting above that. Here, that's where we're living, folks. Big government fails at almost everything. And those of us who sit there with our hands out, waiting for the government to give us something else, we have the wrong emotional intentions. We need to get back to rationality. We need to get back to critical thinking. We need to get back to common sense. We need to get back to understanding that when we turn these things over, when we turn this stuff over to the government, we're in trouble. The government will always destroy faster than the private sector can create it. Uh, stop feeling entitled. You know, I keep telling them, Shutter, I keep telling myself, like, don't preach to folks. Just, just like, let's just, let's be one of these, you know, wise sages that sits around and we come to this conclusion together. Nah, fuck that. <laughs> Let me just tell you what to do. Let me just tell you what to do. Stop feeling entitled. Because it leads to ingratitude and resentment. Ingratitude and resentment. You look around at this next generation. Tell me if they look thankful to you. They don't. They've taken it for granted. They've taken it for granted. That's ingratitude, man. And then they get resentful. Suddenly, they're not getting what they thought they should get. How many of these kids out there telling on their parents oh my parents won't identify me as this or they're dead naming me or blah, blah. they're resentful you're not just giving them what it is they feel like they should have we put that on a, on a on a larger scale conventionally of what our government's doing to the rest of us that's where we're living folks uh god all right get the book 13 and a half reasons I shouldn't tell you this. I should, I should do all these programs and go through it and then, and then tell you to get the book. You'd be like, man, Chad's so wise. No, I just, I just read well. I just read well. I, I don't have to be original, guys. I want to help you. I really do. 13 and a half reasons why not to be a liberal. Judd Dunning, he's not even giving me a cut of this. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow you'll wake up and be like, Dan Gum, my book really started moving. Good for him, man. Good for him. Uh, I don't think I have that kind of power, but I can get canceled. Can people cancel off a of square? <laughs> I want you guys to send me an email, chat at the Chad Prather Show dot com. I want you to head over to the Chad Prather Show dot com and give me your email address so I can send messages to you and then find me out on the road having fun, man, having fun, because you know what? That's the freedom we have in this country is to go out and have a little fun. At least we have it for now. Utilize our free speech to tell a few jokes. People come out there and say, well, man, I was coming out. I didn't I didn't know I didn't know what to expect. And and oh, you really kind of got rough on some of that stuff. That's right. That's called free speech. And we're unapologetic about it. And we like for people to have fun. More particularly, I think people need to have thick skin and come out there in the middle of all that fun. Don't expect everything to brush you the right way. And that's what we're out there doing with a thing called comedy, man. That's the stuff that people used to go to jail for back in the 1950s. Just ask Lenny Bruce and George Carlin over those free speech laws. Man, they just really wanted to put the screws to them. Well, that's why we go out there and do what we do. I don't have to go to live shows. I don't have to go out there and do anything. I could sit here in this cave and just talk to you day in and day out. But I sure do like getting out there with zero filters and zero algorithms between me and you, the live audience. So come find me. You can find my tour schedule, watchchad.com. People say, why don't you come to this city? Well, I will when I want to or when they'll have me. A lot of these venues won't have me anymore. <laughs> they don't like money. They like they like ideologies. That's what they like. We can come out there and we can sell out a show in Portland, Oregon, and then they'll say, we're never having this guy back. I don't know. I thought you were in the for-profit business. Apparently, you're not. You're in, you're in the political ideology business is what you're in, and uh, I'll go to the places. I don't, care if, I don't care where it is. I'll come to the steakhouse with a little stage out back, and we'll play some music for you, tell you some jokes, and you'll have a good time and drink some beer. You can even have a Bud Light. I won't judge you. I will judge you. Secretly and in my heart, I will judge you, tranny. <laughs> you guys know that I love you. I know you got thick skin. I know you can handle it, and um, I appreciate y'all. Go to watchchad.com where all the fun stuff is. You can visit 76forever.com if you want to buy a T-shirt. 
And uh, you guys, I appreciate you more than you could ever, ever know and more than I could express. Whenever you're listening to the Monday and Wednesday podcast audio only, uh, take the opportunity while you're on that podcast program, that profile, that platform, whatever they call it, and go to where you can leave a rating or a review and please leave me one. Let's make this show go higher. Can you take me higher? All right. I appreciate y'all. I love you. God bless you. We'll talk to you next time.